It's the fastest, most unpredictable speedway on earth. Iron made this place. Mine, smelted, forged. And every spring, we gather round and celebrate iron sharpening iron. Oh, he gets tattooed! But in order to take it all home, you need nerves of steel. The big one is back. Get your tickets now at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Roll Tide and welcome to this Thursday edition of Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR. This is Roger Hoover with you from our Tuscaloosa studios as we get set for a very busy show taking a look at Alabama men's basketball in the Final Four. We'll be talking about that a conversation with Chris Stewart as we go through everything coming up on our show for today. Thanks to our friends at RJ Young. RJ Young is the official technology solutions provider of Crimson Drive. They've given us a smart board to go through everything in a real interactive way throughout our headlines. But again, Chris Stewart will start the show as he got to make the call he has been dreaming of making for years and years and years that Alabama men's basketball is headed to the Final Four. We'll talk about that with Chris to begin our show, and then we'll have a conversation with Bailey Dowling, third baseman for the Crimson Tide softball team, one of the first interviews we have recorded at the Advantage Center inside Bryant-Denny Stadium. Fun conversation with Bailey Dowling about her journey from Illinois to Alabama and what's ahead for Team 28. Then we'll take a look back to a great edition that we had on Monday night of Hey Coach, presented by Alf Insurance at Baumhauer's here in Tuscaloosa. Not only did we have Nate Oates, but we had a full preview of what's coming up for this weekend. It is available to watch on demand on the CTSN YouTube page as well as the Alabama Insider Podcast. But Nate Oates will get some thoughts from the head coach of the Crimson Tide as we get set for Alabama men's basketball in the Final Four. The Crimson Tide, of course, reaching the Final Four. First of all, had that Sweet 16 win against North Carolina and then Clemson took care of business in the Elite Eight as the Crimson Tide make it to the first Final Four in pre program history. Great opponent on the other side, the defending national champion UConn Huskies, a number one seed in their own right for this tournament. They will be a tough opponent coming up on Saturday. Our radio start time will be at 6.30. Don't forget as well, at 7 o'clock, the doors will open at Coleman Coliseum for fans in Tuscaloosa. Make sure you go to the watch party as CBS will have cameras there. Your reactions will be shown on the broadcast. Should be a lot of fun, that watch party coming up. I hope they'll do that as well coming up on Monday. If Alabama is able to reach the national championship game, I imagine they would be but roll tied to Alabama men's basketball in the final four. Taking a look at Crimson Tide Baseball, Alabama last weekend won the first two games against South Carolina before dropping the finale by only a run. So a really good performance against a top 10 South Carolina team as Alabama once again won a home series. Now on Wednesday, the Crimson Tide uh, yesterday actually had a trip to Sanford in Birmingham and picked up an 11 to 10 victory, a game that featured two home runs by Gage Miller, TJ McCants, Ian Petrutz also homering for the Crimson Tide as Alabama held on in the end to get that 11 to 10 win over the Sanford. Bulldogs. Now this weekend, the Crimson Tide taking on the Kentucky Wildcats, a team that may be ranked behind Alabama, but Kentucky is off to an 8-1 and one start in SEC play. The Crimson Tide 4-5, and five, but Kentucky and Arkansas are really the two outliers in SEC baseball so far with 8-1 and one marks through the first nine games of SEC play. Crimson Tide on the strength of that series win against South Carolina, now ranked 11th in the country by Baseball America. How about the Crimson Tide softball team? Uh, last weekend, they were also in Lexington against Kentucky and ended up going 1-2 and two against the Kentucky Wildcats. Earlier this week, they were scheduled to play Jacksonville State, but that game was postponed due to, or really just canceled due to all the inclement weather we had around the state. Now this weekend and the next weekend, as you'll hear Bailey Dowling talk about in a moment, home softball coming up at Road Stadium. First of all, this week, it will be Alabama against Ole Miss. And don't forget as well, there's going to be a great documentary done by SEC Story on the SEC Network. Coming up on April 15th, it'll be Bama Softball, the story of the 2012 National Championship team for the Crimson Tide. So we look forward to watching that. Patrick Murphy's been tweeting about it, and we're certainly excited to see that on the SEC Network on April 15th. A few other notes, uh, gymnastics starting today in the Ann Arbor Regional in the NCAAs. I really hope the Crimson Tide can continue this season to the NCAA Championships. Best of luck to Ashley Johnston and the Crimson Tide. Football spring practice continues, and we'll be talking more football, of course, next week with A-Day right around the corner, April 13th at Bryant-Denny Stadium at 3 o'clock. Our radio coverage will start at 2.30 p.m. We can't wait to be back inside Bryant-Denny Stadium for the Golden Flake A-Day game coming up on April 13th. 
Chris Stewart will be calling that for us here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network on Play by Play. He'll also be calling Alabama basketball in the Final Four. Over 20 years for Chris as the voice of Alabama men's basketball. And finally, this moment is here. We caught up with him in Phoenix to get a preview of Alabama in the Final Four. Roger Hoover, great to be with you from Alabama, but we keep talking with somebody on the West Coast, and we'll count Arizona as part of that for this week's show. Uh, Chris Stewart, who's been from Spokane to Los Angeles, back to Alabama for a bit, now in Phoenix, Arizona. And Chris, you're there because the tide keep rolling all the way to the Final Four. Roll Tide, it's fun to talk about basketball here in April. Boy, it is. And a uh, special time, uh, unbelievably special experience. And uh, yeah, 12 straight days. Tuscaloosa to Spokane to LA back to Tuscaloosa and a uh, day and a half at home and then right back out to uh, right back out to the west again and uh, really really cool environment cool setting wonderful greeting for the team yesterday when we got here and it's it's got a um, it's got a big time event vibe and that's because that's exactly what it is. Same thing could have been said about last week's uh, trip to Los Angeles for the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. Crimson Tide getting two wins against North Carolina and then Clemson to reach the Final Four. Uh, take us back to that North Carolina game. Obviously, the Tar Heels, the number one seed in that region. What had to go well for Alabama to have success first of all in that game? Could not allow the Tar Heels to get a lot of second and third chance opportunities. Um, defended at a high level made sure that that they did not give up uh, a ton of second chance looks for the heels um, shot it well and continued to to guard at a level that exceeds what they had done throughout the good a good bit of the regular season so uh, you know I think that's a major thing they continue to be who they are offensively but Roger they've they finally got some things locked in on a consistent basis on the defensive end. And that's what allowed them to, to get it done against the heels. It was really fun to see all of that come together. And, you know, you knew North Carolina was going to make a push and uh, Bama just continued to answer whenever that occurred and thankfully held them off and got the win. Certainly was great to see Grant Nelson, great performance in that game. And then uh, Alabama wins to move on to the Elite Eight for only the second time in school history, taking on a Clemson team that Alabama had faced earlier in the season. But as it turned out, it was a much different result than what we saw in Coleman Coliseum, thankfully, as Alabama reached the Final Four. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's kind of odd because even though they lost that game, I think they had a ton of confidence because of the matchup. They knew who they truly were in relation to, to Clemson. They knew they'd played really bad, frankly, in the game against the Tigers. And that's not taking anything away from their win uh, against Alabama in Tuscaloosa. But at the same time, Alabama knew that if they played more to their true identity, that that would be a different outcome. And that's what we got. And it was another one that was a fight to the end, but so glad to see Alabama play uh, so well down the stretch, defend, continue to make shots. One would make a run, the other would answer back and just continued to keep them at arm's length, thankfully, and got that special finish. Clemson's a tough team, very good. P.J. Hall fouling out was obviously big, but uh, the damage had been done, I think, to them before that. And, you know, talking with a couple of people tied to the Clemson program at halftime, when they had it at 13 with 7.58, I think, the time left, whatever the under eight media timeout was, Clemson's got that as a 13-point lead. And that's a game where even if you let it go five points the wrong direction, that, that looks so different uh, going into halftime. If you only shave five, okay, it's a very manageable game to going into the locker room down only eight. But instead of it being that, Bama completely flipped it and was up three at halftime. And you just had the feeling that even though we're a long way from the finish line, and I think at one point Clemson did take the lead in the second half, you felt like you had taken their best shot. 
and when you were able to overcome that and just play the game from that point forward, then Bama was going to have the opportunity to do what they did, and that is not just survive, but advance and move on in this fantastic tournament to a place that they've never been before, which is the Final Four. What did it mean to you to get to say that on the radio? Alabama's going to the Final Four. You've had some great final calls in football, obviously men's basketball through the 20-plus years as well, but this one certainly is different. Yeah, it's very different. I've done a college basketball Final Four and even a national championship win before. You know, you and I have talked about this. Uh, probably before you were born or a toddler, I did Birmingham Southern back in 1995 when they won – the NAI national championship, different stage, different level. Uh, but if you don't think an NAI title means something, go go on over to the football building and and uh, ask Kalen DeBoer if it does, because he's got three NAI championship rings himself. And, you know, that's an accomplishment. That's a big accomplishment. But the setting, the venue, the environment, the exposure for it, it's just so different. So um, to to have the privilege of broadcasting this for Alabama, also that was very early in my career. Uh, even though it's different you, when you are a part of a championship and it happens in your first or second year of doing play-by-play -play for its school, you appreciate it, but you don't at the level that um, that you do now, certainly 22 years into being the basketball announcer like I am in, in Tuscaloosa in 24, 25 years, whatever it is of being a part of Alabama broadcast. And, but then on top of that, as you and I've talked about too, Roger, I've been a fan since I was a kid. And so to, to see this happen to have, uh, you know, I was a kid in the stands at the BJCC when Derek McKee, Mark Gottfried, uh, Terry Connor and, and Jim Farmer, and I'm leaving out some really good players, but I mean, when that team in 87 played in Birmingham uh, in the first two rounds and advanced to go to Louisville for the Sweet 16 and lost to that Providence squad with Rick Pitino as the head coach and Billy the Kid Donovan uh, as the sharpshooter with Delray Brooks, that was a heartbreaker. Bama was a two-seed and thought that was going to be the team that was going to get over the hump and go to be the first in the Elite Eight and maybe win the whole thing. And it and it was one of several teams, frankly, Roger, that was good enough to win it all if they could have gotten past a hurdle. And the most recent being last year. If that team beat San Diego State, then then that team obviously is one that I think very easily could have won the whole shebang. And nobody would have been shot by it. They were the number one national seed going into the tournament. This one has come out of the blue to some, but not to me. I felt all along that this would be a better team now uh, than at any point. And that has played out that way. And just excited to see them have the, the chance to be in the position they're in. And hopefully they're not done. Hopefully it's it's got uh, two more wins and we will have one heck of an A day uh, next weekend with uh, a new coach, a new basketball trophy in town and a lot of things to celebrate. But it's a um, it's a really cool time and it's it's an important time. The ceiling has been broken and now Alabama basketball, I think, will. I, I don't think this is the only. I think this is the first of uh, multiple Final Fours that will occur with Nate Oates as the head basketball coach. Um, I don't think he plans to take the foot off the gas anytime soon.
Certainly hope not. So again, a great moment for you getting to say, you know, Alabama is rolling to the uh, final four. Uh, and I know you don't want to talk about yourself too much, but this is the Crimson Tide Sports Network. I've got to ask this uh, because we all know your story well here. We've got to document uh, the health struggles you went through a few years ago. Uh, the national stage was introduced to that over the weekend with an excellent feature by the Turner Sports uh, pregame show getting ready uh, for Alabama's Elite Eight game. Just what did it mean to you to have your story kind of told again to a national audience and then the feedback you've received since then it was um, among the many other things roger that have been about this it was surreal because uh i'm literally standing in my hotel room getting ready and i'm watching national tv and there's a feature being produced about me and then when it's over there's ernie and charles and and um and kenny and clark all talking about me it was kind of weird to be quite honest but it was extremely kind um and then i you know was sent the clip later on of what they did at the end of their broadcast night of playing the call at the end um and i'm grateful the story's able to be told because I understand that I'm the face for the story, but the story is not about me. The story is about the medical people that saved my life, that helped me get back to where I can do this. Friends like yourself who have, who helped me tremendously when I needed the help. You pitched in in a massive way and, and not just the bridge leading up to me doing coming back and doing games, but you literally were there to help and assist uh, as I was getting stronger and able to to take on more of my regular responsibility for it. Um, I've said it most, you know, many times, but most of all, just my personal belief that it's a miracle that God did in my life. And it's, none of it happens without his blessing and his favor. It's not something I deserve. It's not something I've earned, but it's something that he blessed me with. And I will forever be grateful for it. And I've, you know, I don't try to beat anybody up with it, uh, wear anybody out, but uh, um, I have a responsibility to share where I think it came from and why I'm able to do what I'm doing now. And I am appreciative that that Ernie and uh, actually an Alabama alum who produced it, Khalil Cage, who uh, you won't hear her name, you won't see her. But um, was actually remember Crimson Cabaret, probably fifteen twenty years ago, when um, that that's where I met her. She's married to a uh, Greg Cage, who played basketball at Alabama, and she came up to me uh, when we were at, at USC at, at shoot around one day, and she goes, "I want to tell your story in a feature. I don't know if it'll ever air because uh, this was before the North Carolina game." She goes, we want to do this and in case Alabama wins and we can we can run it before the Elite Eight game, but I want to produce it and have it ready just in case. So I was grateful that uh, the tie had won, that it wound up on the cutting room floor and uh, the players were who weren't around and didn't know the story uh, were incredibly gracious. One of the most slap me in the face moments about how incredible our team is and our kids are um, was when Riley Griffin comes over to do the post game interview after the elite eight win. And I'm there asking him about going to the final four. And he said, well, we all saw on social media, the feature before it ran on television and we sent it around in the team chat and said, we got to win this for Chris. And that was, that was very humbling and uh, I'm so grateful that everybody has been as kind as they are. I just hope um, that people understand it's nothing really that I've done. I just know how fortunate and how blessed I am. We're extremely grateful for that as well. Uh, moving forward, and again, you're in Phoenix getting ready for these games coming up this weekend. Uh, it's got to start with another tough challenge with the UConn Huskies. Uh, just what's going to be most important for this Alabama team getting off to the right kind of start against UConn on Saturday? 
Roger, I don't think Alabama has to be anything other than what they've been this year when they've been at their best. Uh, I don't think they have to play the game of their lives. Um, I just think they have to continue to be who they've been, but they can't be average or below and expect to get to Monday night. They've, they've got to be the best version of themselves and what we've already seen from them. It's not going to take a miracle. It's going to take 40 minutes. Uh, but if you slack off any, it's, it's not 20 minutes, as Illinois found out, because they played really well for about 20 minutes. It was a five-point game, and the next thing they know, they come out of the locker room, and they were just hammered. A 30-0 run will get you beat if you're on the wrong side of it, and that's exactly what happened. And, you know, you can't have any lapses. You've got to find a way. You've got to find a way to make sure that you are still in that game at the under four media timeout. And uh, they have lost this year. They've lost three games. Uh, and they are beatable. And Alabama, at its best, can beat anybody. They have said that and believed it all year. We have seen that. Uh, but it will take, in order to cut down the nets on Monday, it will take two fantastic performances um, against two tremendous teams, whether it's UConn on Saturday and either NC State, who's been a great story themselves, or, or Purdue. You know, this this could be the retribution tour for Alabama. Uh, you know, you, you beat Clemson, who's already beaten you. You beat UConn that beat you 20 years ago. And then you uh, would – potentially play a Purdue team that beat you earlier in this year. I will say Purdue has not beaten Alabama in the United States of America, though, by golly. We're undefeated. Uh, we're undefeated on this side of the border. So hopefully we'll get another shot at them and, and get it taken care of. Yeah, I'm hoping you get the chance to see Zach Eady in person coming up on Monday if it shakes out that way. <laughs> I would. I, look, I, I'm not going to lie to you. As long as Bama's playing, it doesn't matter tremendously. But I hope it's that big fella for NC State instead of that big fella for Purdue. I may come to regret that if it happens. But, you know, uh, anybody that's here at this point can win it, clearly. And it's special. I think there are two underdogs. There's clearly um, two teams that everybody's expecting to see play on Monday night. But I've got a feeling that NC State and Alabama don't really care about how the script has been written by – by many they're here to, to kind of write their own we look forward to it. well chris you brian and tom have a blast coming up in phoenix we can't wait for the broadcast coming up on saturday and then hopefully on monday night and like you said uh, right after that uh, we'll be talking football getting ready for a day coming up on april 13th but just all the best that's coming up for you and the crimson tide thank sports you. network uh, moving forward thank you for your time with us today roll tide roll tide buddy thanks so much there is nothing like Sweet Home Talladega. Don't miss out on the opportunity to witness the thrill of four wide racing on one of NASCAR's most iconic tracks. From the blistering speed on the track to the unparalleled fan access at the Talladega Garage Experience, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Don't miss out on NASCAR's much-anticipated return to Talladega Super Speedway for the Geico 500 on April 21st. Purchase your tickets today at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Fun conversation with Chris Stewart. Best of luck to Alabama in the Final Four. Hopefully we're talking about a national championship coming up next Thursday on Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. We switch gears to Alabama softball, and we had a fun conversation as well with Bailey Dowling, third baseman for the Crimson Tide softball team, and she is the first student athlete we recorded an interview with in our new podcast studio at the Advantage Center inside bryant Denny Stadium. Of course, the Advantage Center was unveiled in September. Uh, Learfield doing a lot of great work to get that up and running to help connect student athletes athletes with NIL opportunities again through the Advantage Center at Bryant-Denny Stadium. So part of that, the podcast studio is going to become the new home for a lot of our student-athlete interviews. And Bailey Dowling was our first guest. Great conversation about her journey to Tuscaloosa. As you'll hear about, this was a childhood dream for her to play for the Crimson Tide. Welcome back to Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. This is Roger Hoover, now pleased to be joined by Alabama softball third baseman Bailey Dowling, our first in-studio guest here at the Advantage Center at Bryant-Denny Stadium. And Bailey, roll tight. How's the senior season going for yes, you? Yes, thanks for having me. It's been really fun this year. We have a great team, great ke team chemistry, and 
Um, it's just been really fun having all our transfers and all the underclassmen come in and having our new coaches, Bro and Adam, as our hitting coach. It's just been really fun overall. Has it hit you this is your senior season? Not yet. It comes and goes. My senior day, it did. And having all the girls in my class have their senior days, I got really emotional about that. But whenever we just get out there on the field, it doesn't really hit me much. So hopefully, hopefully not till till we're winning. More emotional going through your own senior day or seeing your teammates uh, kind of have their family in town getting that, you know, the videos are really remarkable how they get everybody so emotional on senior day. I think honestly, everybody else's videos just because mine, like I made it. So I knew what I was going to say, but everybody else's like just seeing them and having them for four years or like having Jenna here for five years. It's just watching theirs was really emotional and having their families out there. And yeah, I would say watching everybody else's. And for you, the main message was be fearless. You even gave out wristbands, right? That said, be fearless. Why was it important to spread that message to your team? So when I got hurt my freshman year, I blew out my whole left knee and I didn't really have anything to lean on when that had happened. And my family, I grew up in Illinois, so I never had family here, you know, being nine hours away. It's just the team. And so being hurt and having to go through that journey and rehab and everything, my mom had always given me bracelets growing up in high school and they always had sayings on them. And one of them was be fearless. So that always kind of stuck with me a little bit. And then we started talking about it and I'd found that bracelet again. And that saying just stuck with me. And when you go through a serious injury like that, it's not only hard physically to come back from it, but mentally that's harder, harder to do. And so having that saying, it just really stuck with me. And um, I started telling myself, like, I just need to be fearless through the journey because God always has a plan for me. And just having that saying, I really leaned on it and it really helped me get through that. And it's really stuck with me since then. And um, so I gave bracelets out to everybody for that. And just so it's a little part of me that I gave to them. What does it mean to you now when you could see that with your teammates? Now they're adopting that as kind of their mantra for the rest of the year. I think it's awesome because when you step on the field, you, you can't have any fear going out there. And this game, you can't be perfect. It's impossible to be perfect. So not being scared of failing or, you know, not getting the job done when the team needs you to come through, like you got to give yourself some grace. And so being fearless when you step out there, that's just, that's just part of the game that you have to have. And that's how you become good. And so I think it's cool to see that my teammates adapted that because that's been a part of my journey for a really long time. And that's, you know, you're not always going to be perfect. I'm not always going to be fearless when I get out there because, you know, there's always going to be moments. But having that having that with me in my back pocket is always good. And seeing my teammates have that is really cool. So you did that on your senior day. Then we'll get to uh, what this team is capable of the rest of the way coming up. But I want to go back uh, to the beginning of your journey. Uh, just tell us where you're from and what got you interested in softball. I'm from St. Joseph, Illinois, a small town next to Champaign. Um, it's actually really cool because Lance coached at um, Illinois, so we kind of had that little bond when he came in here. Um, I grew up playing soccer, and I actually love soccer. And I was very shy because I have two half-sisters, and they never lived with us, and so I'm the only child, really. And I just didn't talk much, just really shy. And my mom forced me to play t-ball. Like I did, I did not want to at all. And once we got out there to the first practice, I remember I dove in mud because we weren't even on a field because we were so small. And I loved it ever since I dove and just got dirty. And so I've been playing it ever since then. And um, my dream was always to come to Alabama or play here. And there's a lot of other schools that were on the list, but Alabama was always the number one. And I don't know why, because when you're young, it's always like the name or the colors of the school or like just their jerseys and everything like that. And I guess I just really liked crimson and white. Um, but yeah, Alabama was always number one. And being so close to Illinois, we always, my parents got to take me and watch all their games. And Illinois actually played Alabama a couple different times. And one of them, my parents had drove me to northern Iowa and the Dome, and they had played because it was so cold. They couldn't play outside. And Illinois had played Alabama, and it was when Jackie Trena was on the team still. And in between games, she had made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for everybody on the team. Like, without being told to or asked to, she just started handing them out and making them. 
And me and my dad had stood on the ledge over looking the dugout where she was making them. And it was just the coolest thing because my dad was showing me like, hey, that's how you become a good teammate. Like she's doing it without being told. But like seeing that, it was just really cool. And um, since then, that moment, that was very clear that I just wanted wanted to play here. And I actually wrote a letter to in um, elementary school. I think it was the third grade. Our teacher had asked us to write like our dream or what we wanted to do when we got older. And I had wrote that I wanted to hear the crowd say my name at the Alabama field whenever I'm stepping in the box. And so whenever I had committed here, my mom had brought the letter and like showed the coaches. And so it was just a really cool, like pivotal moment. And it was, it was super cool to see the reaction to that because this really was my dream from the beginning. So you had the dream at a really young age. What's the work like, though, making sure you are on the right track to play for the University of Alabama? What did you do in middle school and high school to become a great all-around player? So thankfully, growing up so close to the U of I, my parents always got to take me to their games, and we actually became really close with a lot of the players. And one of them, Kelly Cervantes, now she was Kelly Waddell, had married one of the um, Illinois baseball players. And they became my coaches at a very young age, like 10 or something. And um, so I grew up having them just teach me softball and give me lessons. And they were my travel ball coach for a while. And I still, whenever I go home, that's who I work out with. So they're they're who got me here today, um, for sure. But yeah, I we would have practices all the time. And I'd always be having like a two-hour lesson before or after practice it was insane to look at now because we don't have time for that but <laughs> back then um that's what I was doing and I'm just thankful that my parents gave me that opportunity and that we were so close to Illinois that we got to become close with Kelly and Matt and that I had that chance to get to work with them because I wouldn't be here without them and of course everybody grinds it out in the batting cages but for you I mean the batting cages are only a few steps away tell us about the barn yeah, I call it the shed, but I guess people don't call it a shed because sheds are small. <laughs> so yeah, the barn. <laughs> um, whenever I got old enough and softball really was like, I always wanted to play obviously in college, but whenever it became known to my parents, they we had moved out to the country because we were in town and we had land to where my dad could build the shed or the barn and it's absolutely huge because he is a construction worker and builds houses and so we split it up into one third of it is for all of his construction stuff and then two thirds is all turf with a basketball hoop and then a batting cage and so that's where I got to do all my lessons and everything growing up and it's just really cool to have that in my backyard because then when I did get into high school I could you know give my own lessons to other girls growing up in our town and so it's been really cool just to see that I got to grow up there getting lessons from Matt and Kelly, and now I'm giving lessons out of it. So I'm very thankful for it. That really is cool. Again, a lot of home runs for you uh, as you cook Illinois softball by storm. You have the career uh, home run record in Illinois, and then you're getting ready for that senior season, getting close to the national record, then the COVID-19 pandemic. Just how tough was it to see your senior season cut short? I think it was more hard just knowing that take away all the records and everything – just that that's a huge moment for anybody that is moving on with their life. Like being a senior in high school, I didn't get a walk for graduation. Like I had nobody, nobody there. Our high school, thankfully, um, let us walk individually. So you picked a time and you could go in on your own and you got to choose four people to be there. And you walked, there was nobody in the gym. It was just you. And they made a video out of it, which was really cool. But you know, you don't have that true high school experience. So just having those things, I guess, taken away was really hard. And I remember that our high school had a night where after everybody had found out that you won't have any spring sports or, you know, we won't be going back to school. Our softball coach had taken all our jerseys and put them on like a pole or a stick or whatever and whatever our position was they went and put them out there on the field so that night anybody from St. Joe could come by and like I guess 
give thanks for like everybody, all the seniors or whatever, and just show them support. And um, we got to, I guess, be out there for a couple hours and just experience that without even having anything to do. So I'm thankful for that. And just everything our high school did when we didn't have an opportunity to finish our season or I guess really even start it. Um, so, I mean, it was cool that they had that opportunity to give us. So that's a whirlwind of the spring dealing with all that. And then over the summer and getting ready for the fall, you've got to get ready to move here to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. What was that transition like uh, finally joining the softball program? It was really awesome. And honestly, I was so excited just to be on my own because my family is very close. And anytime that I had a travel ball tournament, it was always me and both of my parents. And um, so we were just always together all the time. And I want to I wouldn't take that away for anything, but when I'm actually on my own, it was fun just to experience it. And I felt like, um, I was just in a whole different world. Like it was a new Bailey, even though it really wasn't, it was just exciting. Um, but yeah, I remember just being really excited to be off on my own and kind of just have that new, new moment to adjust and show my responsibility and, um, yeah, I don't really honestly remember much because after I'd gotten hurt, I feel like all those memories were a blur. But yeah, I do specifically remember that part. Who were some of the leaders on the team that took you under their wing? Claire Jenkins and Bailey Hempel, for sure. And it was really cool. Claire actually came back our Virginia Tech weekend at home and we got to hang out. And then Bailey and her parents came back for my senior weekend. So it was really an Alabama fan, as we learned. And then uh, you get to know him in the recruiting process. Everything's really positive. But then he's got to coach you at times. So what was that transition like going from, you know, Murph that's trying to sign you versus Murph, now your coach? Well, they always preach, you know, like person first, athlete second. And that is really true here. Um, and just how they recruit you, they're the same person as how they're coaching you. Obviously, there's times where they have to get on you and they're not going to get on you when they're recruiting you, but they never changed of who they are. And I think that just shows a lot and speaks a lot about who our coaches truly are as people because you can put on a show when you're recruiting somebody and be completely different when you're coaching them. And that's not the case here. And I think that's just one of the, one of the many reasons why I love it here and why this is home because... I'm getting better as an athlete here, but they're teaching me how to also be a great person. And when I leave here, those are what I'm going to take with me, not worrying about my stats or what my records were here. So I think that's really cool. When was the first time you heard the word Mudita? Ooh, I honestly, it was when I was being recruited. There wasn't a specific moment that I remember, but it was when I was being recruited and um, when you get here, you have to learn how to think on your toes because we'll have classroom moments in our, um, clubhouse or just on the field. And once we're taught something, we're expected to like, not, I guess, remember it, but like, just know what you're watching or what you're listening to and, um, learn the game that way. So when we're in practice, if Murph is teaching us something in five minutes, you better you better remember that. Or at least like understand what he was talking about, if that makes sense. So uh, he knows you're always paying attention. And so when he had talked about Mudita and a couple other things, like being a servant leader, I never fully understood. Like it just never really hit me, so I wasn't thinking on my toes quick enough because I'm in high school or like middle school at the time, and I didn't understand that that's just how you need to be, you know, when you get older. Like that's just a responsibility, you know, thing. And so then when I got here, I was like, oh, like I need <laughs> I need to know all this. <laughs> like okay, but yeah, no, I think that's just really cool that that's been around for so long, and then that's a part of our. Um, our family here and just part of this po program because that's what makes it good. Again, it's about having joy and other success. Have there been moments where you've had success and you really feel the Mudita from cer certain teammates any time that's really come up in your career? Oh yeah. There's, there's a lot of moments, honestly. Um, a couple of them are from freshman year and then 
some of them are from last year and there's been a couple this year too but one of them I really remember was um when we played FSU at Clearwater last year um it was the beginning of our season it was kind of like opening tournament ish and Kenley Cahalen had just hit a home run and we were up by one and the whole tournament I just wasn't wasn't doing my best or how I normally would do and then I got up to bat and I hit a home run and without that we wouldn't have won and in that moment I remember just and there's pictures of it too but just every single person and everybody who had helped me get there to that point it was just it was really cool to see that and how they supported me and just their excitement. And that just, again, shows what this program is like. Yeah, great moments uh, all throughout that 2023 season and even dealing with the adversity of the Montana injury in the SEC tournament, but able to come back for the regional, the super regional. How meaningful was it to punch your ticket to Oklahoma City for the World Series? It was awesome, honestly. I really don't have words for it because our season was – such like just a wave like we never we'd have good times and then next thing you know like we're 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 down at the bottom of the wave and so just being able to go to the world series and the fight that that team had nobody gave up on each other and so especially through regionals and supers because overall like each person had their moment and we stuck together as a team when we could have just been done. And I think that just showed a lot. And especially for our senior leaders at the time, like having Montana just fight through that. It was really cool to watch and just have her as a teammate show us like what facing adversity is and like how you take it on. So I thought that was cool. And for you, I mean, it had to be, you talk about fulfilling a dream, getting to play for the Crimson Tide in the first place, but how about at the World Series? I know those games didn't go the way you wanted, but just stepping into that stadium, sold out crowd, what that mean to you? It was very crazy because my freshman year we had went and obviously I was hurt, so I never got to do anything. The most I got to do was play catch with Claire because she also did the same thing I did and that's all we got to do. Um and I remember going my freshman year, and I was just like, wow. But it never really sunk in because I wasn't out there. I just, I wasn't playing. I was just there, you know. And then when we got back last year, I was like, this is every girl's dream. Like, I grew up watching this and watching people get here. and was like, I want to do that. And now I'm here. It was, It was just so crazy because sometimes when we're practicing here at home I'll just be in the dugout putting my cleats on like wow like I made it like my dream came true like I worked for it and I got it and then the same thing at the World Series so I think it's just really cool and shows you know what hard work will get you mentioned before uh, you hold the career record for Illinois uh, high school home runs you've hit a lot of key home runs here in your time at Alabama and a lot of great hits just tell us about uh, your approach as a hitter is your swing pretty similar to how it was in high school how's it evolved throughout the years my swings changed a lot in my career here for sure just because of my knee and uh, my sophomore year I was not close to being a hundred percent at all whenever um, season hit and so I was still always fighting that battle with pain and just getting my knee to work and function, if that makes sense. And so my swing had to adjust to how I was feeling like day to day. If my knee didn't feel good, then I wouldn't be comfortable in my stance and it had to change. And so I never really felt like, um, honestly, if you go back and look at the videos, it's, it's not very pretty <laughs> in my opinion, but um, it's definitely a lot more this year like it was in high school, I think. Um, so, I mean, that's good now. It at least looks a lot prettier. <laughs> um, but as a hitter, I shoot more for just line drives and, like, getting my swing off and hitting the ball hard on a line rather than hitting home runs because when you get up there, it's it's just between you and the pitcher. You can't be thinking about your outcome or, like, what you want to do up there. Like, you have a plan, and when you step in the box, your goal is to execute it, nothing more. 
So, um, yeah, when I get up there, it's really just to see a pitch that I can get my swing off on and, like, hit it hard. So, and I think that that's worked for me um, pretty good so far. So Absolutely. To get prepared for all these at-bats, uh, how important is video study or some of the analytics that we're now seeing all over softball? The analytics part is really cool because, you know, now they're creating pitchy machines that you can make throw pitches that are exactly who you're going to face. So I think that that's really cool, and that's something that I utilize a lot um, just to get at bats in and, like, see pitches that I'm going to see in a game and figure out what plan, you know, I want to take when I get out there. Um, but that and just watch, watching film and um, seeing how pitchers, you know, I guess what their mentality is like you can you can see that based on their body language and just how they go about um, their pitches and like what's their best and what's their worst and um, that's definitely definitely very important at at this this age um, because you really have nothing else you can't go out there like it's travel ball and just yeah. you know <laughs> wing it um, so yeah I we do that a lot um, in practice and just on your own watching film so. So time on the road for the Crimson Tide uh, this past weekend at Kentucky. But now you get some home games coming up at the Rhodes House. Uh, first of all, against Ole Miss, Texas A&M after that. Just uh, starting with the Rhodes House, what do you love about the home environment? What do you want to see from this fan base as you continue throughout your senior year here in Tuscaloosa? I love how packed it always is and just how when the fans are cheering you on, like they are on top of you. And a lot of those stadiums that we've played at, it actually feels like they're on top of us, but once they're cheering, like they are right there in the dugout with us. And I think that's really cool. And we get a lot of fans. Um, you know, we have, if n not the biggest, I'm not sure what Oklahoma's is now, but I think that we have the biggest stadium and we get the most fans. Um, and so I think that that's really cool and just shows our support that we get. And, um, so, yeah, I, I get really excited about that when, when it's a packed house because that's – not a lot of teams get that. And when we get to Oklahoma, that's what it's going to be like. And so I like practicing it before we get there. <laughs> that's certainly good. What is this team capable of? Obviously, it's been up and down through the first few weeks of the season, but as you get ready to start this month, April, what's going to be most important? Well, we have a lot of grittiness, and we're never out of a fight. We always find a way to punch back. And so I think that that's really important, just shows like who this team is and what we have. Um, but I'm excited just to see how we bounce back from what we've gone through because we keep talking about how we're going through learning lessons right now. Like we're always learning something from what we're going through, bad or good. And so I'm excited to see how we utilize that and just go about these next couple weekends because we are at home and so we get a couple good practice days before we play and um yeah I'm just excited to see where that takes us we're fired up as well Bailey Dowling <laughs> thank you so much for your time with us uh, here today on Crimson Drive driven by NASCAR all the best to you and the softball team the rest of the way roll time thank, thank you. you iron made this place but in order to take it all home you need nerves of steel the big one is back Get your tickets now at TalladegaSuperspeedway.com. Fans looking to enhance your pregame A-Day experience, visit Champions Lane next to the Walk of Champions from 11 to 3 p.m. on A-Day, April 13th. Champions Lane is free and open to the public and will feature live music, a display of Alabama football trophies and awards presented by NASCAR and Everwood, autograph signings with current Alabama student-athletes and former Alabama running back Trent Richardson. We'll also have a NASCAR pace car, food trucks, and other interactive displays. Visit ChampionsLane.com for more details. So from Brian Denny Stadium, we go to Baumhauer's Victory Grill here in Tuscaloosa, where on Monday we really had a party. Yes, we did have, of course, Hey Coach presented by Alpha Insurance, but it was certainly a Final Four preview show as Chris Stewart had the chance to interact with some members of the men's basketball team and then the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Nate Oates, who brought along a trophy, the NCAA West Regional Trophy from 2024, and we hope there are more trophies in store coming up for Nate Oates. But here's a look back to his conversation with Chris Stewart, talking about the wins over North Carolina and Clemson and looking ahead to Alabama in the final four. Five years ago tonight, I am told, we sat here and did this show, and a new guy named Nate Oates got a very 
warm round of applause as he came in and sat down and joined us. It was a pretty big round of applause back then. It was even bigger tonight, a standing O. You've actually earned this big applause tonight, Coach. Congratulations. First Final Four birth in school history. Hard to believe. Yeah, a little crazy. Five years. It's been five years. Amazing. It took us a while to get here. Finally got here, though. It, it, it took us a lot longer than five years to get to the Final Four, Coach. We're here, finally. You've done your part. Yeah, we, you know, it's hard to get there. Shoot, we've had a few teams that could have made it. We finally got here. Our guys have pulled together at the right time. We're playing our best basketball in March like we try to be. We, uh, shoot, it's amazing. I mean, we've got contributions from all different people to get us here. You know, you go from that Grand Canyon game when Diabate came in. You know, we were down with about five minutes ago, and Diabate came in, made big plays for us. We got the win and thought our guys really kind of, rallied around him you know Sears made the point we don't win this without him and then the next game we get to play North Carolina where Jaron's from Chapel Hill and you know I was hoping he'd have a great game and he, and he was solid for us but you know we had Grant step up and had a huge game I mean there's the 24 12 and 5 with his five blocks I guess 24 12 and 5 against a, a single digit seed there's only been four players in the history of the NCAA tournament to do it. Uh, he's pretty in pretty good company. Shaq, pretty good player. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq. And uh, Tim Duncan, not a bad player. He turned out all right. And then Channing Fry. So it's who played in the NBA a long time too. So Grant Nelson, Channing Fry, Tim Duncan, uh, Shaq, the guys that have done uh, what he did against North Carolina, not a bad program to do it against. And then Jaron, Stepped up for us the next game in a huge way at five of eight threes and at 19 points. Didn't, did not look like a freshman and, you know, looked like he grew up a lot to, to get us to the Final Four. And I mean, I, I didn't I didn't realize till today, I was looking, I, you know, you, I, I, I try to move to the next games in this. R Ryland, as good as defense as he played and as many shots he had, Ryland had eight assists in our last game, which... I, that passed me up until uh, we were in video today, and I just kept saying we were going through that. We kind of pulled our blue collar plays in our highlights league. We do a, try to do we, uh, every game to kind of reiterate what we're looking for. And also, I just kept seeing Ryland pass shot, pass shot. I'm like, how many assists he had? You know, he had eight assists. So it's like different guys you see stepped up. I didn't even realize in the game some of the stuff that the guys did. But yeah, we we had some guys really step up. You know. Sears leadership's been as good as it's been. Nick Pringle's leadership stepped up. I mean, he, man, he had double, double, double digit rebounds, multiple games. I mean, he, he's played well for us. So, different guy, you know, who knows who's going to step up. We're going to need a lot of guys to step up against UConn. They're pretty good. But, but we're here. We're playing. There's only four teams left playing, and we're one of them. It's amazing. You talk about all those guys. And I was guilty of doing this on the radio broadcast, but we, we almost forget at times, oh, yeah, by the way, that Mark Sears guy ain't bad either. The West region most valuable player, uh, 23 points. He just, he, he somehow finds a way to get to that number or close to it every single night. But his, his game has become a whole lot more than that, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, he, like we've said it, kind of he can almost sleepwalk his way to 20 points. I mean, he's got a bad game and ends up with 20. You know, and, and he, this last game, he was a little frustrated. I, what, did he miss his first seven shots or something? Like, you know, he came over, he's a little frustrated. I'm like, like Mark, you're going to be fine. Like, you'll, you'll get to your 20. We're going to be good. Like, get an open shot, you're going to hit him. Right. And you shoot, who knows, he's going to hit seven threes in the second half. I mean, he came alive and, and like, shoot, that, that one he hit from deep. He was at the logo. He was. It was <laughs> a little, like, Dame Lillard, uh, Steph Curry range back there, but no, nah, I mean he's he's been. I think people around here have gotten used to the fact that he can score it at the level he does because he's just been doing it for so long. I mean he had whatever it was, twenty. What is he? Twenty three of his last twenty five or twenty two of his last twenty four. He's at twenty points, something crazy like that. So you know, and, and he's from Alabama. You you know, super happy for him. His family's from here, so. We're here. We finally got we, – we could not have the uh, other school in the state having the only Final Four in the state. That was not – that didn't sit well. That had to change. I'm 
sorry it took five years to get a change, but it, we, we got a change. We couldn't have them having the only Final Four in the state. So we now have one. We've uh, got our hands full trying to get uh, out of that first uh, game in uh, the Final Four, but we're going to we're going to give it everything we got. I've made a quick pit stop, watched a lot of video this afternoon. Quick pit stop here, go home, watch a bunch more video tonight. We'll get a game plan together. Our staff's been on it. We've got some uh, basketball junkies on staff that, that have put together some pretty good game plans. We'll, we'll get a good game plan in place. And then we've had the players step up game after game after game, so I'm pretty confident we'll have some guys step up on Saturday. Coach, if they play their best game, they're, they're great. But we've said all along, Alabama's best on both ends of the floor is one you'll take your chance with, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, we, we haven't had, you know, we've had a top three defense in the country to our last three years uh, before this year. We haven't had that this year. But, th but our defense in the tournament has looked like a top three defense in the country for a majority of it. So we're, we're, we're getting it together at the right time. You know, I if we're playing our best, I mean, we've had a little – variability in our play this year we've looked really good but what we haven't had like the, the really bad losses like we had two years ago we, we we we've lost some games and haven't played our best in those games but but every loss we've had has been to a pretty good team right like so you know our, our metrics were always good through the year now now we're peaking at the right time and you know shoot we we've played purdue we played arizona we've played creighton we played tennessee we played some of the best teams in the country. You can kind of go through all those. You know, now we're, we played Carolina. It was a one seed, beat them. You know, we, we've played some quality teams and been right there in them, up nine on Purdue in the second half. You know, the, the Carolina game, shoot, they won the ACC. It's a pretty good league. Like, we, uh, you know, we beat them to get here. And, and to me, that wasn't like – a huge and obviously it was an upset you know we weren't but we, we weren't they weren't favored by that much and we were we, we everybody assumed we were going to be in the game like we had played our, our schedule allowed us to be comfortable playing the best teams in the country we're going to be comfortable now UConn's been playing much better than everybody they're, they're really good so we're going to have to play well but I, I don't think our guys are going to come in intimidated that's not it like we, we played some really good teams now they're better on both sides of the ball than, than most of the teams we played, but we're, we're going to get a game plan together, and I can think our guys will come in ready, ready to play with them. And Grand Bay is where we go to find Pee Wee and get our first caller of the night. Pee Wee, go ahead with Coach. Coach, congratulations, sir. Thanks, Pee Wee. Great to hear from you again. Hey, one, one of the better head coaches we've had. You know, I, I hear you. you got your own little club that you join when you become a coach in the Final Four. That's a very elite club. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to all of our players, especially the ones out there. You know, everybody, I know how hard these guys have worked. I hope they understand how much very proud we are of them. Uh, and uh, we got a daunting task in front of us, but I think we can do it. Get out there, play our game, push it up, transition point. Maybe we can run these guys into the ground. I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna try to run them. They're they're pretty good in transition themselves. <laughs> they uh, you know I, I you know that the the the, the higher score in the game, I, I think the better off we are. But shoot, if you watch their Illinois game, that 30-0 run they put on, they they their transition game looks really good too. So we're we're gonna we're gonna give it a go though. But I appreciate the, the comments. Did you have a question, Pee Wee? Yeah, I was uh, wondering uh, about Latrell, how he was, and uh, if, what's he looking like for this weekend. You know what? He's looking better. He uh, still wasn't able to practice today. You know, he's still being evaluated every day. But, like, you know, with the head injuries, further away from the injury you get, you know, the, the more likely you are to be able to play. So I think with the, the week between games, he hasn't played in play all last week. You know, I, I think we're going to get, you know, he's got he's to be able to go through a skill workout, then be able to practice, and then still not have any, you know, headache or whatever it is. Uh, you know, the, they've got the whole protocol, and you don't want to put uh, a young man's long-term health at risk for one game. So I think our doctor and trainer have been doing the right thing and, and keeping him out. But I think, you know, he's going to give it a go. He's going to get it in practice, and everything go, if everything goes well, 
after the practice this week, then uh, he's going to be able to go on Saturday would be the hope. Coach, we, uh, we only have about a minute left with you. Tell us what the next couple of days are like. I know you travel tomorrow, but uh, you don't play until Saturday. So how much of that is to just try to get the legs back under the guys again uh, and the old radio announcers uh, to get out there and get rested a little bit early, but also to, uh, to take part in everything that's involved with a Final Four event? You know what? I, what you know, we practiced a little today, but went, went pretty light, not much. We're, we're trying to, you know, we've been banged up with injuries with Davin's foot, uh, Reitzel's head injury. You know, Nick's foot's obviously uh, not 100%. He really sucked it up and, and manned up and, and played well. Shoot, it, it was big for Nick because that Clemson game was against his home state sure. team, so, you know, in South Carolina. But... We're trying to get everybody as healthy as we can over this week while still not losing. I mean, there's a fine line. Can't lose your conditioning. Can't lose, you know, how well you're playing, but still want to get healthy and get your legs under you. So we went a little light today. T tomorrow will be our hardest practice. Wednesday we'll be there. It'll be kind of just a skill shooting day, not, r not a real practice, kind of an off day, but our guys even on off days get in the gym and shoot, so we'll have a gym available for them to get and shoot. Thursday be fairly light Friday even lighter and Saturday we got to go so hopefully our legs are fresh we're playing our best basketball come Saturday because uh, we're going to need to be we've got a, a daunting task in front of us with the way UConn's playing right now well I hope we see you next Monday but I hope it's not here because it would mean that we'll be uh, getting ready for a national championship game thank you and congratulations appreciate again. it thank you appreciate you guys uh, coming out roll tide roll tide coach Nate Oates with us NASCAR is returning to one of its most iconic tracks. Be there and experience the energy, the excitement, and the power as drivers battle it out at Talladega Super Speedway for the Geico 500 on April 21st. Lock in your tickets today at talladegasuperspeedway.com. Crimson Drive, always sponsored by Visit Tuscaloosa as well. Visit Tuscaloosa, your go-to resource for all things Tuscaloosa. Check out their events calendar at visittuscaloosa.com. Well, a busy weekend ahead for Crimson Tide Athletics. It's time to take a look at what's coming up on the Crimson Tide Sports Network with our upcoming schedule brought to you by Wickles Pickles. They are wickedly delicious. We have the relish with us on set here in Tuscaloosa. Here's what's coming up across the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Coming up later today, a new episode of Tide TV This Week will be available on demand on the Alabama Athletics YouTube channel and our TV affiliates around the state. And then coming up this weekend, baseball at Kentucky starting at 530 tomorrow central and then softball at home against Ole Miss at 6 p.m. And then on Saturday, a really busy day as Alabama baseball will be playing earlier in the day at Kentucky, softball at 5 o'clock and softball should be done in time for men's basketball. Alabama against UConn in the final four. Our radio start time is 630. The tip off is Scheduled for around 7:39. Also depends how the first game goes between Purdue and NC State. Then coming up on Sunday, the baseball team with an 11 a.m. start time against the Kentucky Wildcats. Softball will wrap up a series against Ole Miss, and then on Monday night we will either have Hey Coach or we will have the national championship game. If Alabama men's basketball does play in the basketball national championship game, there will not be an addition of Hey Coach, but we will have full radio coverage of Alabama in the men's basketball national championship game against either North Carolina State or against Purdue. More information available on all of our social media accounts. Make sure you're following for a lot of clips and a lot of coverage coming up from Phoenix, from Lexington, and here in Tuscaloosa for Alabama Athletics. And that's going to wrap up this edition of Crimson Drive, driven by NASCAR. Special thanks to our guest, Chris Stewart, who joined us at the top of the show from Phoenix. Bailey Dowling, who again joined us in the Advantage Center podcast studio at Brian Tenney Stadium. And, of course, Nate Oates, head coach of the Crimson Tide. Best of luck to him and Alabama, hopefully cutting down more nets coming up this weekend in Phoenix. Thanks as well to our video producer, Ethan Carabin. He put this entire show together. Thanks to all of you for watching. Now let's gear up for a great weekend of Alabama athletics and hopefully a national championship for the Crimson Tide in men's basketball. For everybody at the Crimson Tide Sports Network, this is Roger Hoover saying thank you for watching. Roll Tide and good luck to the Crimson Tide.